the 20th is the birthday of John Stuart Mill, the English philosopher and author of On Liberty, which was published in 1859. And this year, May the 20th, will also be the Non-Crime Hate Incidents Day of Action, as activists highlight police attempts to criminalise people for expressing opinions that don't contravene any laws. Uh, the reason for the link with John Stuart Mill is that the philosopher was quoted in the final paragraphs of the judgment in Miller versus College of Policing three years ago. Mill said, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. So joining me now to tell me more about the campaign, it's family lawyer Sarah Fillimore. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. I think we need to talk through what's happened with these non-crime hate incidents. Uh, a lot of people watching might not know what they are. When, when did they start and what are they? Well, the genesis was um, the very tragic murder of Stephen Lawrence and the recognition that the Met were institutionally racist. So um, Lord McPherson wrote a report saying, well, how are we going to tackle this? And one of the key elements of how we would is to say we have to bring in something called perception-based recording. Mm. We can't trust the police to listen to people when they say they're victims of racism because the police are racist. Therefore, if anyone comes to the police and say, I perceive I've been a victim of racial hatred, the police must record it and take it seriously and investigate it. Now, that's you know, all well and good. And I think there's a lot of evidence that the men who did murder Stephen Lawrence, they had recordings of them speaking in very racist terms, inciting violence. I totally accept that it's of use to the police to gather information about things which are not quite yet crimes or which could escalate into crimes. But the problem is that the police then became captured by a prevailing orthodoxy, which is that sex is doesn't matter now. Mm. What matters is your gender identity. So if you're a man and you think, well, I feel like a woman, that must be respected and you are a woman. And the reason that Harry's case then came to court is that he fell foul of this orthodoxy. Um, we should explain that. This is Harry Miller, former police yeah. officer, who retweeted a poem that was deemed to be transphobic and someone contacted the police and said, I'm offended by the poem. Police officer visited Harry Miller and said, we need to check your thinking. Oh, there were 30 tweets in total. That was considered to be the worst. Mm. I think it was a song lyric saying, your breasts are made of silicone, your vagina goes nowhere. And, and, and Harry was said, well, that's the one that's closest to a criminal offence. The others were simply Harry going, huh? Or asking a question. I mean, it was yes. when it was when they were read out in court, because I was there in, in the High Court in November 2019, we laughed. Everybody laughed. But, they but, couldn't help themselves. What, what's unusual about it is, you know, even when Harry Miller was approached by the police officer and he asked, he said, you know, has a crime been committed? And the police officer said no. And then Harry Miller said, but why are you here then? You know, yeah. th that's what I think people are confused about, is why are the police recording non-crime when there are crimes to address? Because going back to the good stuff about the McPherson report, there is operational value in recording things that are not quite yet crimes, because you do need to know when there might be a risk of escalation. The problem is, however, if you slather on top of that sensible premise a prevailing orthodoxy, that gender identity ideology is, is what we all believe in now. Any attempt to say that sex is real and it matters is seen as outrageous bigotry. Then people are reported for utterly ridiculous things. Doesn't this also mean that opportunists might use this uh, perception-based <laughs> system to get uh, one over their enemies? Oh, absolutely. Somebody reported me to Wiltshire Police. What they'd done is they'd searched my tweets for the words trans and Nazi and just reported the lot, which is why my dog ended up on a police database under a heading of hatred against transgender individuals. So it's a picture of my dog, and I'd said, my dog would call me a Nazi for cheese. And that was logged by the police? Yes. So, OK, so this is clearly a waste of police time. Let's be absolutely honest yes. about that. Now, when Harry Miller took them to court and appealed this and won, and then the Home Office uh, said to the College of Policing, you have to stop uh, teaching police to record non-crime, uh, then the, the College of Policing basically ignored the Home Office, didn't they? Um, yes, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around why. And the only reason I can think of is this, that for decades now, People's um, financial um, ability to earn money and their professional reputations have been tied up in this whole industry around hate crimes. They can't let it go. It's the water in which they've swum. They've mm. been told for decades that women like me are simply bigots. 
And so they just don't seem to be able to take on board the fact we now have a court of appeal judgment that says very clearly, your guidance was unlawful. And then what do the College of Policing do? There's a very sensible code of practice came out from Parliament. The College of Policing then produced their own consultation on their new guidance, which shows so clearly they just haven't got it. So we should explain, really, the College of Policing are the body uh, that mm. are set up to train police officers. They're like a quango, right? They're, yeah. they're, um, and they created this idea of non-crime hate incident themselves, didn't they? And they put this through. Yeah. This didn't come from the, the Home Office. This was a creation of the College of Policing. So why is it the case that when the Home Office is repeatedly saying to them, you've got to change your policy here, and they're not doing it, why doesn't the government abolish the College of Policing? Well, that's a really important question, and I wonder if it's just because they haven't got anything to replace it with. Mm. I mean, the police do need guidance. The College of Policing has nothing to do with operational decisions, but it produces guidance on what's very important, such as recording crimes and non-crimes. Yes. So it would be quite a big thing to demolish, because that's the problem, isn't it? It's been in situ for quite some time now. But all of this is really a question of freedom of speech, isn't it? Yeah. Because part of our freedom of speech is that we can say offensive things, actually, yeah. or things that cause people to be upset or offended. That's part, that's part of it. You know, you, you, you can't have freedom of speech without the bad elements of it as well. Mm. Um, so why, I mean, we, I mean, now we've got a situation when, when it's like a police state where the police are sort of saying, we're going to decide uh, what you can and what you cannot say. Surely that should be a priority for any government to address. I would hope so, because it's really, really frightening. I kept checking with Wiltshire what they'd recorded, and I found some other stuff. The thing that um, upset me the most, though, was the very last thing I found recorded against me, where a police officer had written, she is entitled to her views, however wrong they are. Wow. So I wrote and I complained, and apparently that officer was sent on a day's reflection course, although wasn't punished. And I said, D do you understand why this is so, so alarming? And they wrote back to me going saying, oh, we understand you, you didn't like the equality and diversity form. I said, no, 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 I didn't like it. It was rubbish. It, it asked me if my gender was the same as the sex I was assigned at birth. And there was no option to say, I don't have a gender, I have a sex and a personality. So, yes, I didn't like that. But what I disliked much, much more was an individual police officer thinking he had the right to record against me the fact that I had the wrong views. And just this time, I hadn't been quite naughty enough to be criminal. But I was clearly escalating. There were three NCHIs recorded against me in the end. So that's clear evidence but, of escalation, isn't but it? doesn't the College of Policing teach uh, the police that they need to be impartial, politically and ideologically? It's part of the police code of ethics. I mean, Harry gives the brilliant example. If you're policing, say, a march in Northern Ireland, you've got to be very careful when you're walking alongside that you're not seen to be marching in step. Yes. It's absolutely essential. If the police aren't impartial, well, then we'll see what happens. Millions of pounds are going to be wasted on investigating things which are just jokes. Well, we've seen, uh, for instance, the UN, the United Nations tweeted uh, just today, I think, or, the, or yesterday, this image. And I, I think if we can show this image, I think this is quite uh, striking. Uh, and this is an image about hate crime. It's not just a comment, no to hate. And there's an image of that gun within a, a loudspeaker. The implication being that words are violence. They're conflating words and violence. Mm. That's coming from the United Nations, not from activists. It seems like the police here have, have fallen in line with that idea, that words can be just as harmful as violence. Do you think that's right? Oh, yes. I mean, what, what's going on is there's, there's a, definitely a European dimension. You know, people have gone on conferences and training courses. This is definitely a campaign with a wide remit. But it's so disturbing, this document. I mean, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights produced by the UN, Article 19, is very clear about the importance of freedom of speech. That tweet bizarrely references an action plan from 2019. So you might say, well, your action plan's not really achieved much in four years. Yes. But it keeps, it keeps banging on about, you know, speech is very important, we will protect it. It doesn't say how, doesn't give any examples of when it's going to balance this discriminatory speech. Yes. And its definition of hate speech is fantastically wide. Um, anything that is considered discriminatory against anybody's claimed identity, and they mean anything. Your identity is an adult baby nappy wearer will be protected. And someone who says, well, I don't actually think that's very nice and I don't really want you doing that around me, that will be hate speech, according to the UN. So this is a real problem, isn't it? Because when you have... I mean, my, my view on this is that the police should not be policing what people say or think. No. That that's, uh, that's a step over into authoritarianism. But if they are going to do that, then uh, they would have to do it completely impartially, wouldn't they? Because we've had, for instance, a, an extreme trans activist saying uh, that they were building up a snuff list of, mm. of 50 gender-critical women that they wanted to to murder, and that yeah. was posted on Twitter. 
Well, that shows exactly the problem. I was recorded by the police as a barrister posting hate, my full name, my address, my email, my phone number. That clearly has a chilling effect. I was recorded for simply discussing my dog's liking of cheese. Whereas this man felt emboldened enough by the current culture to tweet that he had a snuff list of 37 prominent gender critical women who were up to be murdered. Now that, now there was action, I'm glad to say, and mm. his membership of the Women's Institute was rather hastily cancelled. And I know people reported him to the police. But isn't it interesting that that man felt quite empowered to do that? To publish well, that. Well, for a long time, Twitter hasn't published the sort of violent imagery that has come from extreme activists mm. against gender critical women. They've just sort of let that slide. Yeah. But they will kick you off if you misgender. I know that's changed now under yeah. Elon Musk. But that was the case for a long time, wasn't it? And so th what we have here is an ideological capture of the people who are enforcing police codes. Mm -hmm. So is the solution just to get rid of police codes? Oh, sorry, speech codes. Just say, say whatever you want. Um, no, because free speech absolutism is another kind of terrorism. You cannot be free to say anything you want. I can't be free here and now to incite somebody to murder you because you're gay and I don't like gay people. I can't. That would be a criminal offence and rightly so. I mean, Article 10 contains within it those limitations. Freedom of speech is very important, but there have to be limits. I mean, defamation is another one, targeting somebody for abuse. The first step's got to be people not just giving lip service to the importance of freedom of speech, which as case after case, judge after judge has said, is essential mm. to a functioning democracy. The College of Police in consultation, I think, was so interesting because you wouldn't know if you didn't know the history that the reason they were consulting was because their previous guidance had been declared unlawful. Mm. There's not a flicker of that. But the, pro the problem with the argument you've just raised is you're saying we all know incitement to violence is illegal. The activists are saying that when their feelings are hurt, that's the same as physical violence. Well, that's where we've got to focus on because that's clearly nonsense. I mean, the American jurisprudence has got quite a lot of interesting case law because they, their First Amendment is even more forward-thinking than our Article 10. And a big concept, then, is imminence, imminence and proximity. Mm. And that's what's made the current situation so interesting, because the Internet has become the playground where people hurl these insults. And it's not the same as thinking there's this man on the street saying things that are racist or horrible. It's somebody hundreds of miles away on the Internet. Yes. But there doesn't seem to be that recognition of the lack of immediacy and proximity. So... Just before we end, can you tell us about this uh, non-crime hate incident day of action? What is it you're going yes, to Yes, because naively we all thought after Harry's stunning victory in the Court of Appeal back in 2021 that this would be laid to rest. It clearly isn't. The College of Policing are just carrying on their own sweet way, ignoring um, the Home Secretary. So the 20th of May is John Stuart Mill's birthday. We think he's a highly significant figure, as you say, quoted by Mr Justice Knowles. We're asking everybody to make a data subject access request of their police force, and we've done a little how-to guide on the Fair Cop website. We would like to overwhelm the forces with these requests, and we'd like you to tell us what you find, and then tell us if the police won't delete it, because I suspect the bulk of what's now been recorded is as ridiculous and offensive as what was recorded against Harry and me. And do we all have a legal right to access that information. OK, that's very interesting. And are they obliged to delete it now, given the Home Office ruling? Well, this is the interesting thing. I'm in contact with one woman who raised a safeguarding concern and is now recorded as hateful, and the police are refusing to delete it. Now, that hopefully is going to go to court. But the principles of data protection, information that's recorded has got to be accurate. It is never hateful to raise a safeguarding concern. And that makes my alarm go up a hundredfold. Harry had his freedom of speech um, curtailed, but this woman was making a safeguarding yeah. complaint. So people can go to the Fair Cop website, is that yeah. right? And they can get guidance on how to do this. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Sarah Fillimore, thanks very much Thank for joining you. me.